Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to the Science of Kabbalah with your host, Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is Rabbi Yitzhak and unfortunately William is not able to be with us this week. He's traveling. He's actually doing a job in North Dakota. wonder what the weather is like in North Dakota. God willing, William will be back with us next week. And usually when William is not here, I have my most favorite guest on with me or co-host, my amazing wife, Leah Michelson. Shalom, everyone. And and I'm really happy to be here and and really excited for what's in store for today's show. All right. So you and I have been learning quite a bit together. We, We learn together all the time. We learn quite a bit on Shabbat. And we've been learning some interesting Torot, some interesting Torahs from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and really going into a concept that's been dear to my heart. And it's interesting that I use that. It's a good segue uh, because I've I've kind of teased the idea that I'm in the process of writing a book and I haven't really gone into detail on what the book is about. But it has a lot to do with the heart and it has a lot to do with the difference between the heart and the brain. And this is something that's focused on in some of the, the Torah that we've been learning from Rabbi Nachman. And one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on it on the show today is because there's so much going on in the world today. There's so much going on in Israel. Thank God we, we have a ceasefire now and, and things seem to be calm and and hopefully, God willing, the ceasefire will hold. But there's so many things that have taken place over the last year with COVID, with, you know, with different holidays that we've uh, been able to celebrate and not celebrate. And then the tragedy at Mehron and tragedies that we've suffered on Shavuot. And there was a tragedy yesterday with an Israeli family in, uh, in um, Italy with the cable car disaster. There was a pugua. There was a terror attack today. Um, there was the 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 problem on Shavuot in the stolen synagogue um, with the the stands that fell. There's so much going on, and I think that we really need to focus on. So many people are talking about the concept of achdut, of having this unity and so forth. So many people are trying to come up with answers, and I don't know that I have an answer per se. But I think we need to discuss this issue of the heart. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Stay with us. We're going to be right back after a short break here on the Science of Kabbalah on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is Rabbi Yitzchak again, and I'm here with my amazing wife, Leah. Shalom, everyone. So before the break, I kind of talked about the things that we want to talk about, about the heart. And I, I just kind of touched on some of the things that we've gone through. Of course, everybody knows what we've gone through with COVID, and thank God, Things seem to be calming down. Things have gone fairly well here in Israel with that. And and, it and was... things are opening up a lot more. And I think as of June 1st, they're actually lifting the restrictions. Of course, still wearing a mask in closed spaces, but doing away with the green pass. Yes. And, and, and although we went out and there are certain shops that we go into where we kind of you know, don't wear masks anymore. Right. Well, June 1st is coming up quickly. Yeah. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, oh, I left my mask in the car, you know, but it was the first time I went into the well, store. It was our vegetable store and really nobody in the store. 
wears right. a mask. Shalom. Shalom. So it actually or, kind of felt a little liberating. Yeah. Uh, it, freeing. It, well, it's nice to be able to breathe. And uh, and so, yeah. So so there's there's the freeness of that. But yet, in the midst of COVID and everything that we've struggled through the last year with that, we then came in and, and in many ways, I heard somebody talking about this the other day that... Um, that, for instance, Pesach was not Pesach. Pesach was a little bit better this year, obviously. I mean, we always have a great time. But but most of the times on Pesach at a Passover Seder, we're used to having 20, 30 people right, together. Right, right. And so last year, it was just you and I. And this year, we decided to have just you and I, even though things had opened up to have extended families. You know, you still had to be careful. You couldn't have a lot of people in the same room together right. right so it's still it was still a bit a little bit limiting so people would say oh Pesach was not Pesach and then of course for us especially here living in Sfat a terrible terrible tragedy with Mehron unfortunately because I'm disabled I, I can't go to those kind of things anymore as much as I would love to but we can literally see Mehron from the street at the end of our Simta at the end of the alley where we live and we had this ter- terrible tragedy right. of this crushing that took place right. in Mehran. I mean, we heard all the helicopters all night long and just, it, it was just, it was a horrible, horrible time. Right. So we have Pesach wasn't Pesach and Lagba Omer wasn't Lagba Omer. And then we came into, again, coming into Shavuot and we had the, another tragedy with Shavuot where a synagogue down near Yerushalayim, the stolen Hasidim, there was a, uh, a stand like uh, bleachers. Um, right, very similar to bleachers. Right. And it was the top part, like the last few rows at the very top, all of a sudden just gave way. And right. I mean, if, if anybody has seen the video, it's it's horrible. You just see them all dancing at one time and then boom, they've just all fallen. Right, so there was another crushing. So people were crushed in Mehron and then we have this crushing at the synagogue. And so people would then say when Shavuot was not Shavuot, and and then uh, we we just had a terrible tragedy in Israel where an entire family, an Israeli family, also in this cable car accident, which was also again a crushing. Um, this Israeli family, a mother, father, um, one of the children, and the grandparents, I believe, um, Baruch Dayan um For all of these tragedies, we say Baruch Dayan Emet. Hashem is the true judge. And then I mentioned this uh, pagua, this uh, stabbing, this terror attack, and. You know, so people understand um, when they listen to the show, this show is pre-recorded. So if I said today, it it, it actually would mean yesterday because you're going to be hearing this show a day after I record it. So that's just uh, to clarify for people um, that are listening. And then what are we coming up to? We're coming up to in the beginning, not in the beginning, towards the middle of June, we begin the three weeks. The three weeks from the 17th of Tammuz until Tishba of the 9th of Av, which is always a terrible time in Judaism. So the reason I bring that up is because people would say we didn't have Pesach and we didn't have Shavuot. We didn't have Lagba Omer. We didn't have Shavuot. We didn't have these things. It should only be that Lagba Omer. It should only be that Tishba of is not Tishba of. Bidiyuk. Exactly. That we should see the coming of Mashiach in the third temple. Why? Because who can take this crushing? When we talk about this crushing, there's been a crushing of our hearts. We say, we even use these expressions, my heart is crushed. Yes. And and we feel that way here in Israel when these things happen. We feel it across the entire world. Now, what is another thing that's causing us to be crushed right now? It's the, all of these things. And then to, to top all these tragedies off, what did we have? We had war again here in Israel. And we had Hamas, Hamas in Aza, which we, we left and gave them this beautiful area with greenhouses. And they could have built this up and they could have taken the money that was put into Aza or what you call Aza, which you call Gaza, and they could have built hospitals, and they could have built schools, and they could have built houses, and they could have taken care of people. And instead, what they did was they took this money, and all they do is buy armament, and all they do is buy rockets. And so four over 4,000 rockets over a 10-day period were fired here in the land of Israel. 
Right. And actually what's not reported is numerous buildings were not destroyed, but, Mm -hmm. but need a lot of repair. They were damaged quite a bit. Car fires. I mean, we lost family, not our immediate family, but in Israel, everyone is family. That's why when we talk about our hearts being crushed, it's because when someone is killed, something happens, we're all, we all feel it. We're all family and we're crushed. Right. Another part of the crushing for us is, is both the things that we hear in the media, because we hear so many things from the world media, from the international media coming at us, uh, talking about what terrible people we are. And, and these poor fake Estinians, and I'm sorry, I refuse to use that term. People that know me know I refuse to use that term. These are Arab peoples. They come from Arab countries. There's no such thing. It's a made up word that, that came, came up towards the, the late 60s, around 67, um, an invention of Yasser Arafat um, to identify an Arab population that had left this area. There is, there is no pseudo or fake Estinian culture. There's no pseudo or fake Estinian language. And, and we mourn the loss of any life. We mourn the loss of any life. That includes Arab peoples and Israeli peoples. However, when you listen to these people, like for instance, this guy, John Oliver, I mean, I really don't know anything about the guy, never heard of the guy until this whole thing came out. And then I listened to what he said. And it's so stupid the things that he was saying, like he talked about the fact that it's it's not tit for tat and it's not fair because we have an iron dome system that shoots down the rockets and when we fire at them, they don't have any protection. The truth of the matter is, why is that so stupid? Because the only reason we need an iron dome system is because they shoot rockets at us. Right, and also what's not reported is is our army, all of our soldiers, they do what's called, I believe it's roof knocking, or they actually will call like into the buildings to let the civilians know you need to leave. They give them a warning. I don't know any other country that does that. And the things that are being said about us, about Israel, is so cruel, such such cruelty. Mm-hmm. So many cruel things have been said about us. Right. So the so the idea of roof knocking, so people understand if you've never heard that term, a roof knock is where um, the IDF, where where the um, like the Air Force, um, if a plane goes and is going to shoot a missile, what they will do is they will shoot first or drop a non-explosive device on the roof of the building. They call that roof knocking that does not destroy, but just lets people know that when, within a few minutes, they're going to bomb that area. And usually what they've done is they've already called ahead. They text people, they WhatsApp people, they call them literally on the telephones. There's actually a recording. You can Google it and you can listen to where the army is actually speaking to a resident in a building and telling him. And he says, oh, so you mean I should tell everybody to leave? And they said, yes, you need to tell everybody to leave. The, the problem is, is we don't hide behind. We, we have Iron Dome that protects us. What is their Iron Dome? Uh, civilians. They put women and children. They put their armament in hospitals and schools, uh, you know, in apartment buildings. Um, they, everything that they do, they do to make us look bad. There are situations where people have refused when the IDF calls them to leave and says it's better for us that you bomb us and kill people because then we can make you look bad in the media. And that's exactly what they do. So we see cruelty. Now now we have to talk about another part of cruelty. And that's not the cruelty of our enemies. That's the cruelty of our own people, other human beings. The silence is astounding out there. Yeah, silence was definitely not golden. Yeah. In this period. I mean, it's amazing. It's great. We saw rallies recently uh, on Sunday all across the, you know, in the UK, in Miami, in Los Angeles, in New York. There were rallies and it's great. But uh, so many stayed silent. So, so many stayed home and so many stayed silent. So we're going to have to go to a break here in a few seconds. But when we come back, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the kind of numbers that we have as the Jewish people in the world 
what the numbers were like before pre-Holocaust, before the Shoah, and then talk about the numbers we were at now, and then talk about some of the things, continuing to talk about some of the things that are being said in the media, but then really going into this idea of cruelty um, and really going into the Torah, seeing what uh, the Tanakh says about this and seeing what Rabbi Nachman says about this in the the Torah that we were talking about, these Torahs that Rabbi Nachman talks about, which I, which I think are relevant to this, about the heart and cruelty and compassion. So stay with us. We're going to have to go to a short break, and we'll be right back here on the Science of Kabbalah. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Shalom. I'm Leah Haroni. Join me on my show, News from the Torah. Each Sunday, we'll use the weekly Torah portion as a prism for understanding the news today. Listen to news from the Torah to gain clarity about the times we're living in and to understand your own spiritual path in the process. News from the Torah every Sunday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to part two, section two of the Science of Kabbalah here with Rabbi Yitzchak and my amazing wife, Leah. So before the break, we were talking about this idea of crushing and I said we would get into a little bit about what a little bit more about what the media was talking about. And so first I want to talk a couple of numbers before we get into the media and celebrities and all the things that people have to say. So I was listening to a reporter on I-24 News. I-24 News is a, a news station here in Israel. And this reporter was talking about herself, some of the things that were going on. And she brought up some very interesting statistics that I thought were important in this conversation. She talked about the idea that prior to the Shoah, prior to the Holocaust, we were a little over 16 and a half million, probably about 16.6 million Jews in the world. And then, of course, we had the Shoah, we had the Holocaust. And thank God, our numbers have grown um, from that time. But right now, we are probably only about 14.7 million Jews in the world today. Now, to put that into perspective, we were talking about all of the things that we're hearing about what's taken place in this war that we just had here in Israel. And so many people opening their mouths like John Oliver. And then you have the two Hadid sisters um, who are models. So, So here's the perspective for you. One of those sisters has 66 million followers wow. on social media. Wow. And the other one has over 40 million followers on social media. So think about that. When you're saying that we're 14.7 million Jews in the world, then one of them has over four times as many followers as there are Jews in the world today. And the other one has at least close to three times as many followers as there are Jews in the world today. And while they posted some very anti-Semitic things, which they then realized I think were very wrong, and so they took them down. But you're talking about, okay, there's probably some overlap, but you're talking 66 million and 40 million. The point is, even if you go to 66 million people, that means that there are over 50 million people more than there are Jews in the world that are following those people and that are listening. And anti-Semitic tweets. Right. And, and you have anti-Semitism rising 400% in the UK. Yeah. You see every day in the US, and I said it's great that there were rallies on Sunday, but I guarantee you there weren't uh, one of the, um, an Orthodox Jewish um, 
uh, used to be a politician and uh, speaks quite quite frequently, uh, spoke the other day and said, how come there aren't a million people out on the street? How come there aren't a million Jews out on the street? I mean, we, we watched an interview with the two Israeli, two Israelis that were walking down the street and uh, were attacked, former IDF soldiers that live in Manhattan now. Um, and they were the ones that got arrested. Right. I know. I actually was watching that and I'm seeing all the fake Estinians, I guess, or maybe I shouldn't say fake Estinians because, but anyways, people that support mm -hmm. the fake Estinians and watching this and watching them attack a Jew, a Jewish person, and, and he's fighting back yet next thing you know i'm like oh my gosh why are they putting him in cuffs and not the people that actually just attacked him it just confounds the mind and it just reminded me of what was going on here mm -hmm. and how everybody in the media outside of israel was saying all these cruel things and we see the cruel things that are going on around the world with the jewish people and just so you're aware it wasn't just Jewish Israelis. It was Israeli Arabs that also were killed during this war. Right. So why, why are we bringing all this information? Why, why am I bringing these numbers up? And why am I trying to show you some perspective here? It's because this is not just about the Jewish people. It's not just about the silence of the Jewish people. And it's not just about a change of heart in the Jewish people. This is, we're talking about a change of heart for the entire world, for all human beings. Anybody who has listened to this show for any length of time knows that my show is geared towards teaching Torah to the world. And I've said it on so many times that I believe the role of the Jewish people in being chosen does not make us better than anybody else. It just has given us different obligations and responsibilities than other nations of the world. And our main obligation and responsibility is to teach the world about Hashem, how to draw closer to the Creator, and 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 learning how to do that through the Torah, through the, the blueprint of creation, through a blueprint of the way to live a life. Um, we, we, we're hearing constantly this concept of achdut, the Jewish people are talking about achdut, this idea of coming together in unity. And yet what we see is we see people out there, Jewish people that are not standing up. There are Jewish people that will stand up for Black Lives Matter. They will stand up for LGBTQ um, situations. They will stand up for all kinds of social injustice. But yet they will look towards this population, this Arab population, that is doing nothing but uh, shooting rockets. And I want you to know another fact here. Another fact is that there is a large group of the Arab population that lives in Hamas-controlled Gaza that would be extremely happy, extremely happy for Hamas to leave. It's, it's crazy to me when I see people in the LGBTQ community standing with signs supporting these people when you don't realize that you could not live in Gaza, that you could not live amongst those people because you would be killed for being gay. And yet there are people that stand up for all those social injustices and yet will not stand up when there is injustice to other human beings simply because they live in the state of Israel and because we are Jewish people. Uh, I've been on a rant enough. So, so we need to bring in some Torah. We've been talking about this idea of um, this idea of cruelty. So there's a very interesting Torah in Lakute Maharan Tenyana, the, the main uh, work of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. This is uh, in the second part of Lukuter Maharan, Torah 4, where it starts off, where he brings a verse from Melachim Aleph, from 1 Kings 17, where he says, Ve'et ha'orvim tziviti lechal kelecha. Where he's talking, this is talking about Elijah the prophet, who has a dispute with King Ahab, or Ahav in Hebrew. And Elijah, in 1 Kings 17, basically makes a decree that there will be no rain anymore, because the, the Jewish people have also fallen 
to the ways of Achav, to idol worship. And so he says, it's, not, it's actually not a, a decree of Hashem, it's a decree of Eliyahu. Eliyahu says that there's not going to be any rain until he says so. And in that uh, verse that I just read in 1 Kings 17, 4, this is Hashem saying to Eliyahu, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you. That's, that's always been very interesting to me. Rabbi Nachman actually compares this to the idea of giving tzedakah, to the idea of giving charity. And he says that, that basically when a person begins donating charity, he has to break his heartlessness or his cruelty and turn it into compassion. I read that and I thought to myself, okay, that's great. Talking about the idea of tzedakah. Tzedakah comes from the root tzedek, from the idea of righteousness. So to me, it's not just about the idea of physically giving charity, of giving money. This idea of turning cruelty in com into compassion is basically even Hashem saying to Elijah the prophet, to Eliyahu, you made this decree. You're stopping the rain from coming. You need to turn your cruelty into compassion. And why are there ravens? Well, if you look at Chazal, if you look at the Jewish sages, we know that the ravens are considered a bird that is cruel. Ravens don't even feed their young. So, so we have this example of turning cruelty into compassion. And that really opened up something else to me from another Torah that we've been learning which is in Lakute Maran, in the first part of Lakute Maran, Torah 49, that you, have, you and I have been studying for quite some time now, you know, about the heart. And that's the idea, because if you look at that first Torah, in Torah 4, in the second part of Lakute Maran, that I just quoted, in this idea of turning cruelty into compassion, we all have to realize that within our hearts, within each one of our hearts, there is a point of cruelty. Right. That we need to look into ourselves. We need to take a step back. What do we need to take a step back from? We have to take a step back from trying to come up with answers to everything. Everybody has tried to come up with answers for everything. And they think that they have the answers. And there is not an answer except to be quiet right now. To reconnect with Hashem to really meditate, to try and go into our own center point of our being, into our own souls, into our own hearts, and trying to find that place of cruelty within us and turning that cruelty into compassion. We only have a, a, a few seconds here left, and so that's what I want to focus on in the final part that we come into. In How do we do that? How do we do that? How do we stop trying to come up with answers? How do we go into ourselves? What does Rebbe Nachman teach us? Uh, with these last couple of seconds, just realize when we come back from the break, we're going to get more into this. We're going to talk about this cruelty into compassion. We're going to talk about our hearts and how we can do this and what we can do to change ourselves. So stay with us. We're going to be right back here on the Science of Kabbalah on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Political Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. 
Shalom, everyone, and welcome back to our final segment. And in our previous segment, you were talking about the heart and the cruelty, and this is a time for us to be silent, vaidom aron. And how do we go about changing the cruelty into compassion? What what can we do? So you brought up Vaidom Haron, and that's something that you and I have also been talking about. It's the first thing that popped into my mind when when everything started happening for me in getting this message about the heart and this idea of cruelty and compassion. I when I heard what happened at Meron, I, I think you remember I might have mentioned this. I don't remember if I mentioned this on the show. I believe with Rabbi Amichai Cohen, I talked about this because he was there. And we, we talked about it right after, the week after. And I remember saying that uh, something happened to me that afternoon um, when I was walking outside. And and then we saw what happened at Meron, the terrible tragedy. Again, Baruch Dayan Emet. And I thought to myself, everybody was coming up with with an answer. They were blaming this group. They were blaming that group. They were blaming this person, that person. And I thought to myself, everything that we've gone through with COVID, you know, we had people on every extreme, you know, the vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers, you know, Mayrone, we have people coming up with answers. Everybody's trying to come up with an answer. And this idea of Vaidom Aharon, that means Aaron was silent. Aharon was silent. Aaron, the brother of Moses, the brother of Moshe, who was the Kohen HaGadol, the high priest, when he found out that Nadav and Avi, who his two sons, had died, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moshe came to him and said, and tried to comfort him, it says in the Torah, Vaidom Aharon, and it could be translated, Aharon was silent, or Aharon was still. Right, so almost like during that morning time. Right. So he, he just was silent. He right. didn't try and come up with an answer. And, and that's why I'm saying that rather than trying to come up with answers right now or trying to point fingers at anybody for blame, in every situation, we need to be like our own. We need to be still. Uh, we need to try to hear the, the voice of Hashem again. And I'm not talking about literally. I'm talking about in that idea of sitting back quietly and meditating and finding a place where we reconnect with their inner point in our own souls and finding that point of cruelty. So I, I brought up Torah 49, Rabbi Nachman. And Rabbi, this is a very deep Torah. It's actually very interesting because he, he actually gave this lesson in 1803. And he basically said that he didn't give this lesson for the benefit of his Talmudim, for the benefit of his students. Like he wasn't trying to teach them anything. He really was trying to stop decrees that were coming down against the Jews by the czar. Like we talk about dinim, judgments or decrees. Mm -hmm. The truth is, again, I said I don't have answers, but there are a lot of people that say, okay, we're, we're coming under some form of the decree from Shemayim, from heaven, with all these things happening. So that should give us pause to sit back and say what's going on. So so I think it's interesting that, that he brought this Torah at that particular time. And what he does is he starts off in a very deep way because he talks about the creation, the whole idea of the Tzimtzum, the idea of the very beginning of creation where we talk about the Ein Sof, the Or Ein Sof, the infinite light of Hashem, and how it, it, there was no room for creation, and basically that Hashem had to make room for creation. And, and Rabbi Nachman talks about the idea that one of the reasons, amongst many reasons, besides the idea that we say that Hashem wanted to pour out his compassion on something, is he said that the Holy One wanted his malchut, his kingship, to be revealed and we say, ve'en melech am, that there is no king without a nation. So that he, in other words, Hashem created human beings who would then accept the yoke of his malchut, the yoke of his kingship. And the same way that that he had to like lit some same, he had to remove himself, so to speak, to the sides and make room for creation. What we know is creation. Rabbi Nachman compares this, and that's called, when Hashem moves to the sides, it's called a chalal haponoi, a vacated space. 
that Hashem had to make a vacated space to make room for creation. And Rabbi Nachman compares this for us making a halal hapanoi within our hearts. Making a vacated space within our hearts. Wow. That, that we make a vacated space within our hearts. And then he goes into the idea that it's through the vacated space that Hashem created the worlds. And he says that these worlds are actually attributes. So when, if you've listened to the show enough, you know the idea of attributes, the different attributes of Hashem through the Sfirot, Chesed, Gevoah, the idea of loving kindness and, and judgment or strength, all the different attributes. And then he says this. He says that the designer of the attributes is the heart. And he gives the example that the chokhmah, the wisdom of the heart, he uses that as an example, that that's the designer. And he says from Exodus 31.6, I have placed wisdom in the heart of all those who are wise in heart. And thus, he says, the main formation took place with chokhmah, with wisdom. And he goes on and quotes from Tehillim, from Psalm 104.24, where it says, you created everything with wisdom. And so he says, we see then that the tsayar, the designer, as it's written in also Tehillim 73.26, tsur, rock of my heart. All of these things are, are just incredible. The idea of the rock of the heart, we can talk about Moshe and Moshe striking the rock because, because there's another Torah in Torah 20 of Lukutei Maran, where Rabbi Nachman talks about the tzur and the tzela. There are two different words for rock. Tzur is one word for rock, and tzela is another word for rock. A tzela is a porous rock. It's a rock that's porous. In other words, it has a certain amount of water in it, a certain amount of mayim within it, whereas a tzur is a hard rock. So think about that with your heart. You can have either a porous heart, um, that rock, because he just said, sore of my heart, rock of my heart. You can have a tzur, a rock, uh, this heart of yours that doesn't allow anything in and has to be stricken and you have to hit it and hit it and hit it to get to the, to the, to the heart of things, you know, to use a term. Or you can have a selah, you can have a porous rock, a porous heart where there's a certain amount of compassion in there and the hard part is the cruelty. So... He goes on and he talks about the fact that in that halal ha'panoi, in our hearts, and this is where the whole idea of cruelty and compassion comes in, is he says there's two things. Because he says, after he goes into this idea of tsayar, this idea of being a designer, and this tsur, the rock, he says, but there is a yetzira, there is a formation for good and for evil. He says, as our sages of blessed memory taught, and Hashem Yitzer, he formed in uh, Breshid in Genesis chapter 2, 7. And we know that that Yitzer there is with two Yuds. And why does it say, why does Chazal, why do our sages say it's with two Yuds? Because there are two inclinations, which is what Rabbi Nachman says as well, that we have within our hearts. The good and the evil the and the Yetzer Tov. We have the good inclination and the evil inclination. And then he talks about this idea of the flaming of the heart. We know that a heart itself has an electrical charge. This is something that I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about in my book. The idea of when we talk about that hardness of the rock and the something that you, you kind of bang up against something. There's a new science I've talked about, cardioenergetic. It's this idea where science is now saying that the heart is even a more intelligent organ than the brain. And, and when you think about it, the heart gives off a certain, the heart has flame. Rebbe Nachman talks about this a lot because the blood is being pumped through the heart to the rest of the body. There's a certain heat that's produced by the heart. And he talks about this being a flaming of the heart. And he says it could be both good and it can be bad. You can have a flaming heart um, that just gets to the point where you you think you've arrived. You think that you you're doing the mitzvot. You think that you, you know everything you're doing is perfect, and, and you that's flame out. And you flame out. You burn out. You burn out. And then there's the person on the other end of the spectrum that thinks that they're not worthy of anything. 
that, that they were, I'm a worm and I'm not worthy of Hashem, I'm not worthy of God. And he says, that's also bad. So it really comes down to the idea of finding balance in our lives. It really comes down to also finding a contraction of that flaming and, and coming to a sort of a revelation, Rabbi Nachman talks, of the midot, the attributes, to serve Hashem in stages and in measure because midah, the singular, can mean in measure. So what are we saying at the end of the day? I know we've talked about a lot of different things here. What I'm saying at the end of the day, because there's so much more I could talk about this, but we don't have time. It really comes down to the idea of really sitting down, taking the time to take a step back, not being so affected by the things in the world, recognizing that there is a thing that goes on between your brain and the heart. And maybe we'll talk about this more in another show. We need to be a people that don't allow our brains to overtake our hearts. We need to be a people that this compassion comes really from thinking with our hearts and not thinking with our brains. And the only way to do that is to sit quietly, is to take a step back, to meditate, to find that place of cruelty within our hearts, and to slowly ask Hashem to turn that cruelty into compassion. Ah, we ran out of time, as wow, usual. It fast. went really fast. Uh, I, I hope you, really you, you take my words with love, um, because this is something I'm working on as well. We hope you'll stay here on the Science of Kabbalah with us every week here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Garrett from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.